This is episode one of Discovering Classical Music, Holst the Planet. But first, I'm going to start with a quick introduction. If you want to skip around, I put the timestamps in the description. It is definitely time for me to start a podcast, and this is so that I can put out more regular content while I work on my master's degree. And actually, it seems like an ideal format to introduce the great masterpieces of music to you. I can talk about them, play musical examples, and you can listen to it while you do your cooking or travel to work or walk your dog or whatever it is you do. This podcast will accompany my YouTube channel, Inside the Score, but if you're new to this, then welcome. You don't need to have seen my YouTube channel to follow these episodes. One of the things I really want to do with this series is reintroduce to you the joy of listening to an album or a work of art from start to finish. I remember back when I was 17 or 18, after school finished, I would often just come home and switch off from the world for half an hour or an hour and just completely immerse myself in one long piece of music. Maybe you used to do the same, either with classical music or listening through a complete album by your favourite band or singer. But I feel like even in the last few years, our lives have become ever more distracted. Our lives are constantly consumed by Reddit, Facebook or whatever. And so immersing yourself in one long work of art is harder to do. We can just skip to the next song, skip to the next one until we find that one three minute gem we were looking for. But what we lose is that rich, fulfilling experience of just sitting back on your bed or your armchair or sofa and truly immersing yourself in an album or a symphony from start to finish. So I want you to train that anxious reflex, the one that keeps telling you to skip to find the next distraction. Train that reflex to shut up because I want you to have an experience with this music. So turn your speakers up, turn your phone off and immerse yourself in this music. So let's talk about Holst. He was an English composer who lived between 1874 and 1934. The Planets was composed between 1914 and 1916, so it's now over a hundred years old, which is amazing because much of it still feels so modern. The film music lovers amongst you will already know his music has been a huge influence on composers such as John Williams and even Hans Zimmer. In fact, George Lucas used this piece, The Planets, as a temp track for the first Star Wars film before John Williams produced the score. But when you listen to The Planets, you'll hear so many ideas, colours, textures, moods, which have resonated and been immensely influential over the last century. So it really is an incredible piece of music. The planets musically depicts seven of the major planets from our solar system, or rather, not only the actual planets, but the Roman gods or the astrological characters associated with them. So we get Mars, who is the bringer of war, Venus, the bringer of peace, Mercury, the winged messenger, and so on. I love this because Holst paints such different characters for each planet. There's a huge difference between Mars and Venus, or between Uranus and Neptune, for example. Also, it's such a filmic piece of music in many ways, and that's why I think it's a good place to start. Another thing to mention is it has this massive orchestra, way bigger than normal. It has 16 woodwind players, 15 brass players, a large collection of percussion, strings, a celesta, That's the instrument we hear at the beginning of Harry Potter. And to top it off, a massive organ. And even then, he reserves one extra special instrument until the very last few minutes of the piece, which gives an amazing effect. I've heard people try to make versions for smaller orchestras, and it just doesn't work because so much of the power from the planets comes from the sonorous effects that Holst creates. He really is a brilliant orchestrator. The last important thing to say before we talk about the music, if you want to truly stand out as a composer, it's important to find your own musical voice. And I truly believe that Holst did find his voice. He found a harmonic musical language which distinguishes him from all the other English composers of his time. Holst truly found his own voice, and you'll recognise this music as having Holst's distinct energy and inventiveness. And boy, is it inventive and ahead of its time. So let's talk about the music. First, there's Mars, the bringer of war. This movement is a kind of war march or preparation for war. The movement is this big ball of tension and angst. 
It's famously in 5-4. That means there's five beats in every measure rather than the typical four or three beats that we're used to. And this gives an irregular feel to the march. He starts the movement with this marching rhythm played col legno. That means with the wood. All the double basses in the orchestra are striking their strings with the wood of their bow, and it gives such a cool effect. Then there's this famous, ominous motive brewing underneath. Until the tension brews and boils over. And I won't spoil all the corners of the work because I really do want you to go away and listen to it yourself with the pointers that I've given you. There are some little side alleys in this piece with brass fanfares. And strident string themes sometimes playing variants of our ominous motive. One thing that I should say at this point, it's important not to get caught in the trap of trying to imagine a movie along with the music. This piece isn't written to accompany a movie. I know that when I started to listen to classical music, I used to always picture scenes in my head, and because of that, the music always felt wrong and too old or weird. This might happen to you at first, and that's absolutely okay, but try to slowly detach yourself from needing visual imagery to accompany the music. Instead, learn to hear it as inherently filled with tension, release, climax, excitement, like this moment. Or, in other cases, the music might be inherently expressing beauty, the sublime, or something much more inner and reflective, and we'll hear moments like that later on. I've actually made a video on expression and emotion on my YouTube channel, Inside the Score, and that talks about how music can express things in this way. I'll put a link in the description. So anyway, the music boils down again, becoming this dark, brooding, slower five-beat theme. Before building back to the main music again. And then, before the end, we get this devastating scream, a cry from the abyss. And then, after one final intense string flurry, this incredibly destructive, forceful battery of hammer blows. When you hear that in the concert hall, it just leaves you frozen by the sheer power and musical intensity behind them. What a dramatic way to begin a suite of music. Movement two is Venus, the bringer of peace. This is a complete colour change. Again, try not to imagine this with pictures, but as music expressing something for its own sake. This movement has this beautiful, lulling harp strumming. We get interludes of a solo violin playing this peaceful melody, which becomes a middle section for the piece. Unlike the last movement, there is barely any tension here. Ingeniously, his harmonies avoid almost any tension at all. This is very akin to the impressionistic works that were being written in France with Debussy, Ravel and others. I'd encourage you to just listen and let your soul move and dance along with all the ebbs and flows of expression in this movement. There are some really beautiful orchestral textures and colours.
Again, it's a very filmic movement, but in a totally different way, with some touching moments and gentle surprises within. Movement three is Mercury, the winged messenger. This is a short, quick-footed, light-hearted movement. At first it seems almost silly, but it's actually brilliantly constructed. There are five or six recurring musical ideas packed into this terse movement. Here are a few. See if you can spot them all. This melody in particular. is passed all around the orchestra, and suddenly what seemed silly flowers into something expansive and almost godlike. I'll let you discover yourself how Holst develops that motive. It's a brilliant, witty piece of writing. Movement four is Jupiter, the bringer of jollity. This brings another complete colour change. It has an amazing, bubbly, grand opening, like walking into a great old hall to join a feast of the gods. This motif is incredibly important throughout, and it's juggled with this one. We get this brisk section. Then this grand, wonderful waltz, which just builds and builds until it's of epic proportions, as if all the gods are entering this great ballroom to dance. Then, of course, after some more playfulness, we get this most famous hymn, which has become deeply meaningful for the British. And after this, we get more brilliance, including some sections we've already heard. We hear the brisk section again, we hear the grand waltz again, though with a few differences to keep things interesting. And the coda, the last section, is this brilliant whirlwind of colours, while that famous hymn tune builds in the brass. Have a listen. It's a great bit of tension and climax. And in case you missed it, here's what I meant by that first motive appearing everywhere. It's here. And here. And here. And here. Even here in an ostinato. And the very last notes of the movement are that same ostinato, but massive and in slow motion. Movement five is Saturn, the bringer of old age. This starts with a slowness, a strangeness, a stasis about it, like the Ents from The Lord of the Rings. It's in no hurry. It feels like this extraordinary expansiveness of time across generations. But then suddenly there's this strangely awesome riff that starts to build. and it does not hold back from becoming something very satisfying. A 
after that's fulfilled itself, we're left with this slow, plodding, marching idea. But these footsteps begin to become the footsteps of giants, growing ever more massive and terrifying. And when that dies down, we're left with this beautiful texture of harp harmonics and bass strings. And then this refracting, glistening wind texture. There's a lot more to this movement than first meets the eye. It all ends with this absolutely gorgeous chord. Something that was a terrifying giant can also be so delicately beautiful. What an interesting way for Holst to deal with the idea of old age. Movement six is Uranus, the magician. This is one of my favourites. It's just a lot of mad fun, very playful, with several different themes. This motif sneaks in everywhere. The movement is just this wonderfully fun, mad dance. Again, detach yourself from images and let yourself go with the dance of it. There are a few surprises in here too, a few of Holst's devastation chords. And occasionally we get glimpses of the magician's immense power too. What was playful will suddenly become overwhelmingly powerful. I suggest you go listen to it and find out what I mean. And finally, movement seven is Neptune, the mystic. This is perhaps the most inventive of the bunch. It's very different from the rest. Holst creates incredibly mystical textures in the orchestra. And even though it was written between 1914 and 1916, it literally sounds like a modern day film score, which is quite amazing. The movement takes you into another space or another world altogether. The most amazing part of it all is when you suddenly realize this celestial sound has entered from apparently nowhere. A choir of upper voices is singing from another room. We hear this sound, but we cannot see the source of it. Apparently, it's coming from another planet altogether. Remember, this was before recorded music was commonly available, so the effect on audiences must have been totally entrancing or mind-blowing. And slowly the doors to this other space close shut, muffling the choir until sound and silence become one. It really is an extraordinary, otherworldly effect when you hear it done well.
So I'd encourage you to set aside 45 minutes after work or in the weekend or whenever you can switch off and just be undistracted and listen to this work in its entirety. Turn it up to a good volume and just become immersed in its power. You'll hopefully find the experience very enriching. Of course, you'll want to find a good recording of it. While you might want to dig around for yourself, I would recommend two recordings. You can purchase either of these or find them on Spotify. The first is Adrian Bolt conducting the London Philharmonic Orchestra. This is a grand, big sound. It's an older recording, but it's just brilliant, energetic, bright, vivacious. Bolt was actually the first conductor to ever conduct this piece. This CD also comes with Algar's Enigma Variations on it, which is another great English piece which I should cover in a future podcast or video. The only issues with this recording are, for my taste, Bolt takes the famous hymn from Jupiter a bit too fast when I want to wallow in it a little more. And also, the choir sounds a little bit bulky, not the ethereal, mystical sound we might want. The other recording that I would recommend is Simon Rattle with the Berlin Philharmonic. This is a much more modern, 21st century sound. It doesn't have them blast with that energy that Bolt cultivates, and actually, I love that energy from Adrian Bolt, but this recording is a very refined, world-class performance. Rattle takes the hymn at a good pace, and the choir sound entrancingly beautiful. This CD also comes with modern pieces inspired or influenced by the planets. I actually love this. I find it much more rewarding to listen to modern works when they are placed in context with older works. It's like it sets off a chemical reaction between old and new, bringing it all to life. So that's it from me for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. This is the first time I've ever podcasted, and I'm sure to learn and get better as I produce more and more. Do like this, subscribe to it if you enjoyed it, and let me know if you can what pieces you might like to discover or learn about in future. Thanks for listening.